goes by. Russia is getting closer to the capital of Ukraine. What does the United States and NATO do? Do we step in, start a World War III? Well, today we have Professor Timothy Sale on the show talking about his book, Enduring Alliance, A History of NATO and the Postwar Global Order. We'll try to figure out what the next steps of NATO and the United States. Can they stop Putin? And even after this war is over, what's next? I'm Tony Sweet with Truth Be Told. Please welcome to the Truth Be Told studios for the first time, Professor Timothy Sale. We'll let the crowd calm down a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I, I probably should even have an applause because of our uh, the topic we're having. Uh, but uh, I think we still need some some kind of light in the world. Uh, <laughs> but, well, thank you, first of all, for being here, Professor uh, Tim or Professor Sale, whichever you want to be called. Tim's great, Tony. Uh, Thanks okay. so much for having me. You got it. Well, you know, you you have a great background. And could you introduce yourself when it comes to your uh, credentials to the audience? Sure. Yes. Thanks very much. I'm a historian at the University of Toronto, <laughs> which means I do a lot of archival research and dusty old libraries. And I've written a book on the history of NATO called Enduring Alliance. And I've done some other research, too. I also did an oral history of George W. Bush's decision to surge in Iraq. So my interests have been studying and teaching about war and peace. And human, the human race has been in war and peace from day one. <laughs> um, but I, I thought we would start today because, you know, we, we of course, we, we're talking about Putin and Ukraine, but this goes way further back. So NATO and the United States are kind of just sitting by. We're, we're kind of waiting. And, you know, I've heard from President Biden, you know, if you attack Ukraine, there's going to be consequences. Well, they attacked and a lot of people are like, okay, what's the consequences? Well, there's a lot of sanctions going on, but what you know, to me, that's not a consequence that would probably scare Putin to the point of backing off. So let's go back to where NATO began. Uh, I think that's important for people nowadays, especially a younger generation that may not know what NATO is all about. Sure, absolutely. Well, NATO is now over 70 years old, and no one expected for it to live that long. It was born in the early Cold War. And what's intriguing is that it's still with us. The Cold War is long gone, or maybe not looking at the world today. Right. But the best way to think about why we have NATO is this great quip that this British diplomat made in the 50s. He said that NATO exists to keep the Americans in, the Germans down, and the Russians out. And so really quickly, the Americans and the Europeans understood after the Second World War, we need the United States in Europe so mm. we don't have a third world war. So let's keep the Americans in. Also connected with those two world wars were the Germans, obviously. And if Germany was going to be a country again with its own army, the Allies decided, let's let it develop, let's let Germany rearm but be a part of our alliance. So keeping Germany down is how they put it. And third, most important, but not the only reason, was to make sure that Western Europe was strong enough so that the Soviet Union couldn't invade or more likely bully their way into influence in Western Europe. Well, and so Russia was actually part of NATO for a long time until, what, 2014, 2014? So you you can correct me on that, but why? How did they stay so long in NATO with all the things that they had done, or were they kind of on a uh, uh, not a, a probation? <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's a great question. It's this really awkward relationship that begins in the 1990s. So during the Cold War, it was NATO versus the Soviet Union, NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. Right. And they were planning to fight each other. In the 1990s, of course, the Soviet Union is gone. The Cold War is over. <clears throat> so what do you do with Russia? The idea was, if NATO is still going to exist, and it did, was to create a relationship with Russia. It was called the NATO-Russia Council. And that led to... NATO allies and Russians sitting down at a council table. It meant that there were Russian diplomats who were actually mm -hmm. at NATO. So they weren't an ally, 
but they were closely connected. But that relationship started to get sticky in the late 90s and is obviously really sticky now. So when NATO started, I mean, like I said, it was, it's what, 70s, it's 70 some year old now? I, I, I don't... Yeah, it's going on 73. <clears throat> so it's 1949 is when the treaty wow. was signed. So when when uh, Obama left office, Trump came into office, um, you know, some people like think that Trump did not want to pull out of NATO, but it, not necessarily, maybe he didn't want to pull out, but he was questioning the what NATO, um, the worth of keeping NATO. So how do how do we answer that when somebody of you know American president says something about NATO? Does that weaken it quite a bit to where Putin kind of got that little grin on his face, saying this is an opportunity? I think you do have to wonder and expect that Putin saw an opportunity with the United States in some ways stepping back from some of its world roles and different presidents <clears throat> before and after President Trump talking about the United States not being able to be everything right. for everyone. And the, the Trump presidency is really fascinating here because but the president, by raising doubts about NATO, he was never explicit that he wanted to withdraw, but some of the European allies, it made them think, what might happen? What should we do? And it actually, in a sense, you know, I'm being metaphorical here, but right. kicked them in the pants and made <laughs> them think, do we want to keep this alliance and what do we need to do? And so if there's anything that this last year has shown us, maybe the most surprising bit is that the Europeans seem to have a new commitment to their defense that wasn't so obvious in the post war post cold war world yeah and why why are some of the the you said there's around 70 70 countries now a part of nato uh, yeah it's about 70 years old and there are 30 allies oh 30 allies okay so what what does it take and what what does it take to be a part of nato because you know, you know, Russia's not, China's not. There's certain countries that are not. What, what is the criteria for NATO to even apply? Because I know Finland's now thinking about applying. Or right. so, what, what is the, what is the criteria? Yeah. So there is a geographic criteria, but it's pretty broad because Canada and the United States, and then 28 countries of Europe are a part of it. So there is a European and North American geography to it. But the most important way to think about it, I guess, is that states have to ask to join, they have to want to join, and all of the allies who are already members have to accept that state into the club. So it's a two-way street. There are some specific rules and guidelines. States that have unresolved borders or mm -hmm. conflicts within their borders right. cannot be admitted to NATO. So NATO doesn't allow states that are in the midst of a conflict to join them because that would automatically put the alliance at war, for example. Um, so there was real questions as to whether Ukraine would be able to join NATO now anyway after uh, what had happened in 2014 there. Right. So there are some rules, but it's basically you have to ask and everybody else has to say yes. Oh, this is like a, like a jury almost. You know, <laughs> you have to have everybody agree that uh, to be a part of it. But I think can I, if Tony, if I can just add on that, I think it's that's really important to keep in mind because NATO got bigger in the 1990s <clears throat> after the end of the Cold War and, right. and states joined it. Sometimes people say, well, the United States just made NATO get bigger. In fact, all of those countries asked to join. So nobody has ever been forced to join NATO. Countries went and sought this alliance with the United States and with the other allies. So Russia, you know, even when they helped against the Nazis, it wasn't that Russia was the good guy. <laughs> they weren't, They weren't. you know, necessarily allies of everybody else. It's just that the Nazis were also invading their country, too. Um, so... How soon, I mean, I, I, as we know, you know, we almost had a World War III during the Kennedy crisis, or the uh, Bay of Pigs crisis, but um, how how long did Russia, because it seems like they was in a long time to NATO, so how, I'm trying to, ha how to say this without <laughs> being unpolitical, 
or political a little bit, but um, that they wanted to become the old. Well, I guess it was when the the Boris Yeltsin left is when actually uh, Putin took over. But how I guess how soon did Putin want to create the old Soviet Union? Because um, if you if you know or not, because that's really one of the reasons why he's looking at the Ukraine and Crimea and all, all these other countries. What is your thought about with NATO and that about him wanting to kind of recreate the old Soviet Union? Right. So I don't think that was obvious to everyone and anyone at the beginning of Putin's reign right. towards the end of the 1990s, right? I think people had some doubts about him and what type of person he was going to be. Right. But he did in the mid 2000s, start to give speeches in 2005 and 2006. He said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe to ever occur. And he started giving really strident speeches, a really famous one in 2007, in which he basically warned that he thought NATO was expanding. He thought the states of Western Europe and the United States were not paying attention to Russian security interests. And then so going from that, you know, he does fit in a long pattern with the Soviets and with the czars of wanting to make sure that the countries on the border of the Soviet Union or Russia can be a buffer zone to protect right. Russian interests. So I see a real continuity there. But if they were part of NATO, a NATO country wouldn't attack another NATO country due to the terms. So that doesn't make sense when it comes to the security of the agreement. Right. Yeah. So it's interesting. They they were never a part of NATO and that they were never an ally. Right. And, what, right. But what they did try to do was join NATO. So even in 1954, Soviet diplomats were saying, hey, let us into NATO with this idea that they could break um, NATO. Um, I don't know if they're if Putin is as worried about security concerns, which is what he says. I actually think he's more worried about political and economic concerns and Ukraine becoming maybe a part of NATO, but also a part of the EU, and having a different model of economics and politics right on his border. So I actually think that he sees a bigger threat in politics and economics to his power than being worried that he's actually going to be attacked. Well, that's that was a, a question is, uh, why, why now? Why this particular time Putin decided? And I interviewed last week about... Uh, during the Trump administration, it actually probably would have been a better time, if any, that the, him, him invading Ukraine with probably not as much resistance from the United States, at least, you know, that's a speculation, but not saying it wouldn't be. But why do you think now, one year into Biden administration and uh, the, now Putin's making this move? Right. Yeah. This is the this is the sixty four thousand dollar question. <laughs> so many right. people got this wrong. I got this wrong, and so I did not think he would do it because I thought it I didn't would either. not. It would be a disaster. I did not think it would go well. But it seems to me, and there was some really interesting information coming out of the Russian security services today on this. I think that he thought it would be easy and quick that right. Europe was mm -hmm. not going to step up, that the United States had other challenges to deal with. And I believe, based on especially those first, first day and a half of the war, that he believed he could win this extremely quickly, knock out Ukraine. And I think that was a mix of both hope on his part and the fact that it seems nobody wanted to give him bad news. <laughs> so he asked, maybe he asked if this was possible, but it certainly seems he got a lot of information from intelligence people, from his military commanders. Yes, we can do this. We can do it fast and we can win quickly with no cost. So I think the calculation was this will be easy and over quickly. No one will respond. And at the moment, it looks like you got it 100 percent wrong. And with you know, because Ukraine is not a member of NATO um, and like I said, we keep threatening that you know there's consequences and that kind of goes back to my earlier like uh question but yeah. 
Do you think Putin will? I mean, just from your gut feeling that he will continue after Ukraine? Because if they go into Poland, let's say if they go into Poland, that's right. a NATO country. Do you think yes. that uh, NATO will respond? I do think that if Putin, the Russian forces go into Poland, that NATO will respond. And the real question, of course, is will he? And so I think it's it's really striking. NATO itself <clears throat> has reinforced its borders, but you're right. It's not acting in Ukraine. Right. Different NATO allies, like Poland, like the United States, like Canada, others, are sending these anti-tank guided munitions right, and right. other weapons to Ukraine. And they're doing that through Poland. Mm -hmm. And so it's intriguing to me that the Russians have not tried to disrupt those weapons going into Ukraine. Me, that's what I was saying. I'm like, how are they getting those weapons in there without him getting all pissed off? <laughs> I'm sure he knows the airfields. I don't think it's a mystery to him where they are. And so that's this question, right? If he does disrupt them, then I do think he could face a war with NATO. So why isn't he acting? Because I don't understand how he can let this war continue to fall apart without it having major consequences for him at home because of these continuing right. sanctions. And it's a disaster. Um, so it's I do think the NATO allies are running a risk. And I'm not saying it's not an acceptable risk, but they are running a risk by the allies openly sending weapons to Ukraine. It seems they've made a calculation that they can get away with that. But the whole problem is it was miscalculations that got us into this war. So I, I am mm -hmm. I am worried, just as a human on Earth, of this war expanding. And without putting blame on any one <clears throat> possible person who had expanded. But we have seen wars grow and become world wars that were not supposed to be world right. wars. We have seen miscalculations and disasters. You mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we were lucky to have uh, for that not to become a nuclear war. But as, as I said, I teach history. We were teaching the origins of the First World War this week. Oh, Nobody really? expected that to be yeah. a world war. Right. Nobody wanted a world war. They thought this was a, we could do some stuff, get our way, and it would be a short contained war. So people make mistakes and miscalculations, and we've got a lot of those ingredients on the table right now. It, it re actually it reminds me a lot of the, the World War II when the Nazis started you know, invading surrounding countries and a lot of america we're like no we don't we don't have nothing to do with it you know right. the, the you know we're we might send a few you know some guns and stuff from aircraft over whatever we sent over and then until we actually you know pearl harbor that got us into with the japanese i mean it really wasn't our war and it kind of reminds me what people say now it's like why are we gonna why are we going over why would we help and all this stuff and i'm like well I mean, if because uh, I don't think Putin's a madman. Um, I think he's just, you know, a, a, a dictator that wants power. And I think he's put himself in a corner to now where he has no choice because backing down is going to make him look weak. And so he, there's no way that he's going to back down. I just don't see it. I don't see it. But um, but yeah, even the corridors of letting people out. Well, if they're if they if they're going to allow corridors to let people out, that means there's no corridors to let weapons in. So that's why I was like, how are they getting these weapons to the people that I mean, maybe leave and all that's, you know, on the western side. But, you know, Kiev and I think Odessa and all these other places, I just don't know how they would even get the weapons they need to survive and, and fight. Yes. And so it's it's striking what has been done already and that it's been achieved. And then we had this really interesting case this week. This seems to be a bit of a diplomatic disaster of this idea of these Polish MiGs trying to get them to Ukraine. Um, and that was really interesting because there were different NATO allies who clearly had a different vision. The <coughs> Poles seem to have really been keen on getting these fighter craft to the Ukrainians. They had an idea that they could fly the aircraft to a U.S. airbase in Germany, to Rammstein, and that mm -hmm. they could end up in Ukrainian hands. The United States has said no to that, hmm. but then also has said more recently, if some allies want to give fighters to the, Ukra to the Ukrainians, they can. So there are some really curious, I, I would love to see the records one day. Yeah, I me hope too. we will. Some really curious backroom discussions happen. How far can you take this? How far can you support the Ukrainians without 
making this into a world war. The calculations, I think, must be very stressful uh, because they do hold the fate of Europe, if not the world, um, in their hands. And that that kind of goes into, you know, the no fly zone. It's right. it's like, how are you going to even if we give planes to Ukraine, we're flying into Ukraine airspace, which the Russians not necessarily control. But there's a lot of, you know, planes coming out of Belarus. And exactly. and so it's like it, it's very close to where the western side of Ukraine. So it's like I don't know how they're not going to engage before they even get to the point of origin or not origin, but the point of destination. So um, I agree. This no fly zone has been fascinating. We've got people arguing for it. Right. I understand the moral argument there. I like I feel that deeply and I can understand why people want to do something. And this seems like a good option. But to have a no fly zone, I mean, you pointed out you are possibly shooting down Russian aircraft, but to fly your aircraft you also need to suppress enemy air defenses. Right. <laughs> and some of the air defenses that cover Ukrainian airspace are in Russia. So are you going to bomb anti-aircraft missile launchers in Russia? Hmm. And we've also seen in the news that um, some of the Russian fighters are actually not entering Ukrainian airspace, but launching cruise missiles into Ukraine without actually entering Ukrainian airspace. So do you target them and destroy Russian fighters that are not even in Ukraine, it's enormously messy. And mm. this is a real case for miscalculation in my eyes. One, one question I asked last week, uh, Putin has already put on the table about potentially, if anybody gets involved, a nuclear weapon. He never was very specific about it. He just threw it on the table. Do you feel, you know, with the history of just Russia itself, um, you know, every every leader has their own personalities, as we can see with, you know, American leaders. But do you feel that that Putin could push that button if 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 he's provoked? He's certainly sending signals to remind everyone of Russia's power in this area. The one was um, it wasn't a major alert, but something of a nuclear alert manning nuclear command and control center. So not right. moving weapons into place, but the right. alert. And then also these speeches, as you mentioned, where he alludes to them. And I do think that this is a warning that there are red lines, that there are things that he will not countenance before escalating right. the war. I don't think it means initially that he would push the button to destroy, to send these intercontinental ballistic missiles aimed at Washington. Um, I think that it would, if he got to this point, and I hope he doesn't get to this point, right. I hope no one gets to this point, but there are different strategies from the Cold War and today to try and signal. So the very first one is this demonstrative, like a demonstration, demonstrative use of nuclear weapons. Right. You pick an area where there's no major population or no population maybe even over the sea and you demonstrate a low kiloton nuclear weapon and that signals you have broken the nuclear taboo you will use them so that might be one signal we would see if we ever hmm. got to that point and there could be escalation from there um but once that escalation begins it's the 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 impetus to keep it going and the challenge of stopping it just seems almost uh, impossible to me well, I think, you know, he's already crossed lines. And if he, if if he did, you know, use any type of chemical or biological weapon or nuclear weapon, I, I feel and I was, again, I've asked this question before is is once this is resolved or to a point, it's hard to believe that the world would keep him in power um, because of it. It already proves that he's, you know, he's he's to the point where there's no return. And, and I gave the example of going in uh, Iraq, going into Kuwait. You know, we, we came to their defense. We pushed them back. We went to Baghdad. Eventually, you know, Saddam Hussein was completely taken out um, of power. Uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, for Russian history, I, I, I don't know their history that well, but I don't, I don't know of any other Russian <laughs> A leader that's ever been taken out for by any other country. I mean, he seems to be taking a lot of other people out, poisoning and assassinating and stuff like that. But what is your thoughts on 
after the fact, after this is all resolved or over. You're right. I can't think of anyone taking out a Russian leader, and that's because Russians usually take each other out. It's sort <laughs> right. of the pattern of how these things have gone we in hope. the past. <laughs> so you have coups and things like yeah. that. So, yeah, a couple of really interesting points there. On the chemical biological issue, it's not impossible, right? We've seen the Russians do this before and right. countenance it before in Syria. What What strikes me is that with all of the world watching Ukraine, and I, I don't know exactly what it's like where you are, but there's some pretty major public, um, su- major public support for the Ukrainians, and some really deeply felt antipathy for the Russians as people are watching these bomb right. drafts. So, the public's invested. If the public turns on the TV and sees the Russians dropping chemical bombs on Ukrainian civilians, our leaders now say they don't want to escalate this war. But I think there's going to be enormous political pressure not to wait till this war is over, but to do something to stop it. Right. So that's one way I could see this war growing. After the fact, oh, I mean, all of the people that keep Putin in power or help, that he has around him are starting to lose and at least lose money, but lose power and influence right. because of this. So I can understand why there would be people wanting to replace him. But he's going to have some say in this, because what does he do next? Where does he go? He can't just ride off into the sunset. There's where no. we go in the world. So it's really <laughs> worrying. And that, 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 as you said before, painted himself into a corner. And we all know with animals and people that when people, when they're trapped, that's There's when no they way take out. They're wild just gonna, decisions. It's like a yeah. bad boyfriend, you know, or b- girlfriend. It's like, if nobody, if, if I can't have you, nobody's going to have you. And it's like, if I'm going to be taken out, I'm taking everybody with me. And I, that's what, fe- that's what makes me fearful about the nuclear part of it. Yes, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And when you and your state are basically the same thing, that's when that gets very, very scary, right? right. He is <laughs> Russia right now and Russia is connected with exact with is him he is the brain of Russia and and it just shows the the dangers of these systems these political systems do you think this popped into my head about Ukraine and NATO do you think uh, NATO or Ukraine will get a golden ticket and just says we're going to let them into NATO what's the you know we don't need to worry about Russia now because now we're <laughs> it's already happened. <laughs> I saw that. So the Ukrainian government is running an amazing media relations campaign. Oh, he's, I have to war. say they're doing a great job. And I saw one message that was coming out that was it saying that NATO was going to ask for Ukrainian membership rather than Ukraine asking for NATO membership. <laughs> and I thought that was really fantastic. Right. So I've been, there's a bit of a contrast here. I've really been struck that the European Union is basically going full blast on bringing Ukraine into the EU. Um, I don't think we'll see that with Ukraine. Um, It will depend what happens next in Russia. But my sense is that Ukraine in NATO will be on would be unacceptable to to any Russian leader, even Putin. So I think, honestly, it depends on how this war ends. I know that lots of countries are committed to Ukraine now, I think they'll remain committed to them after on the bilateral mm-hmm. level but whether ukraine will be in nato i i think it's unlikely in the near term um and maybe a longer term thing well one, we got a question from i call him my co-host in the chat room uh easy said uh, is there any country on earth that just might send forces to support ukraine do you do you think there's any country that would just say i we don't care we're we're going to go help that's a really really interesting question um i mean there are a lot of ukrainians around the world for sure lots and lots but some of the biggest groups of ukrainians are actually in nato countries mm. um and so those countries all face this challenge of the fact that they would be bringing nato in Right. So and that's why I've I've been really interested to see just how many people in Europe and in Canada and the United States have gone not on behalf of their country, but on behalf of themselves and on behalf of Ukraine to fight in Ukraine. So we've got really large numbers of um, volunteer contingents that are there. Um, It reminds me of the Spanish Civil War with these international brigades when people went to fight not on behalf of their country, Mm -hmm. but on behalf of an idea. So 
I, I can't imagine it happening just because of the geography and NATO, but we are seeing people from around the world certainly going to, to fight for Ukraine. Yeah, I've heard at least 6,000 Americans, and I, wow. I, I, they didn't say if they're U Ukrainians or not, but they said 6,000 Americans have approached and said, we would like to go fight with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So, right, yeah, and I don't think these people are all necessarily <clears throat> Ukrainian Americans yeah. or Ukrainian Canadians. Some of them might be, but there's a, a big news story up here in Canada because one of the most famous snipers in the Canadian Army um, has uh, gone to Ukraine, and it was in the news. He left his his wife and his one year old child to go fight, and uh, it's a public relations success. But these people are deadly, and and right. they will make a difference on the battlefield. Well, uh, somebody was asking. Is the United States, do they have any type of responsibility in this current war? This is a, this is a tough one to answer. And there are, there are definitely people, lots of people who, and, and I think for sound intellectual reasons, would argue that the United States pushed NATO too far to the east and that this just was unbearable for the Russians and they were going to have to push back. So that is one. And I respect that argument. I understand it. I don't agree with it at um, the end of the day. Um, mm -hmm. And and the reason is because the United States had a really difficult choice after the end of the Cold War. Should they just leave Europe to its own fate again and just see what happens? I mean, I've actually seen the documents in the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library where people, his National Security Council staff is saying, we have to make sure NATO survives so that the Europeans don't go back to what they did, the things that started the First World War and the Second World War. So yes, keeping NATO alive and it expanding added to the, is a, is a part of the tensions that led today. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the only cause of it, but I think we would have had a bloodier 1990s and 2000s right. in Europe uh, without it. I mean, it was bloody. There were the wars in the former Yugoslavia, but we didn't have these interstate wars. So, you know, it's never black and white on these things. On balance, um, I don't I don't blame the U.S. for the decisions they've taken here. Right. And uh, I know, you know, Vice President Harris is uh, have been in Poland and and uh, her remarks about the U.S. commitment to NATO Article 5. Does that benefit the Ukraine, do you think? Or does that really doesn't make a difference in the way it's going right now? Yeah, I think that's Article 5 is key. It's the bit of the treaty that says an attack on one state will be treated as an attack on all. And what states do in response to that is up right. to them. But because Poland is protected by that right. article of the treaty, it lets Poland be the staging base for these weapons going into Ukraine. And so NATO is essentially backstopping this war because of the Article 5 provisions. And I think that has two really big effects on the war. One is the weapons themselves. Right. And I do think we're seeing they make a big, they're making a difference. They're now the number of anti armor weapons going into Ukraine are making a difference. Now we're going to see anti aircraft weapons. The other thing, though, if you're a Ukrainian person and you see that this alliance is its leaders are speaking out about sending you weapons and supporting you, I think it must have played a role in the Ukrainian people's will to fight and the Zelensky government's decision to fight this war and not give up. Um, so NATO is playing a role here. It's just an offstage one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, this, I just every, every day and like you said, we, I think we all did not think I, I've heard Democrats and Republicans that, that are friends of mine that were like, oh, he's not going to go in. And, you know, like you said, it really did shock the world that he did do this. And uh, I would I would have loved to hear, hear the back back room conversations on both sides to just to you know hear hear the thoughts of Putin I, I wish we could just get in his head and and see what he you know he thinks but um, I don't know um, well before we go uh, you know I I know that uh, with NATO and and uh, all the other countries that are surrounding Russia do you feel that uh, 
you know, after Ukraine is secure and oh, I, OK, one more question. This is sure. the question. This is what I wanted okay. to ask Germany. So, yes. Nate, you know, they were they they were one of the reasons that NATO was kind of created because of the Nazis and uh, the World War Two. Now we're with Russia being aggressive, you know, we have to help support and build up the armies of like Germany again. And how does that work when we had this agreement that Germany wouldn't, you know, be able to kind of create this army like it once had? Because as we know, leaders, new leaders come in. We don't know if friend today, enemy tomorrow. How do we how do we prevent another country that may be part of NATO today and, and we help build it up and then turn out to be another Nazi, or Nazi Germany or a Russia or, you know, how do we right. prevent that? Sure. So, well, I, I will say I do think Germany has changed. Um, it's people are not the people right. of the last century and so on, but it does not matter even before the Nazis, not just because of where Germany is and its power in the past, it was connected to all of these other wars. So this right. is why NATO survived the end of the Cold War, why we still have it today, is because right. it provides a home for these states. Right. It makes sure that France and Germany, who went to war against each other three times before the end of the Second World War, are on the same side. Right. But the other thing that NATO does is it is built on these agreements and these treaties. And one of them includes the prevention of Germany developing its own atomic, biologic, or right. chemical, chemical weapons. So the NATO alliance does put or is connected with these restraints on German power. And it also means that German army units or military forces are all integrated into this integrated NATO military, which has officers from around the alliance, but is commanded by an American. So NATO is has sort of tied the loose cannon of Germany mm -hmm. to the deck, if you will. It is Germany's home for defense. And that's why the alliance has been so important and lasted so long. And, and the last thing is, you know, your book, Enduring uh, Alliance. I'm going to show a picture of it so people, if they're interested, they can pick it up on Amazon and I'm sure other outlets. And it, but it says a history of NATO in the post-war global order. A lot of people, when you say global order, new world order, all these things, they, they get a little nervous. Sure. That's well, not what I mean, Tony. But yeah. that's what I was going to say, <laughs> how, just so people know that that's... Yeah. <laughs> um, I hear you. Yeah. yeah. But uh, when you put that together, did you think that people might think that, that post-global Post -war, yeah, World that's War. that's that's fascinating. No, the, I'll tell you what I meant by that. I, I meant that NATO, and especially through the American lens, while it does, the U.S. spends money there, has right. troops there, it's cheaper for the United States to help maintain NATO and keep Europe at peace than to have to deal with Europe as the site of war or potential enemies. And um, I mean, the historical example here, but there's a bunch, is Richard Nixon um, going to China hmm. and working to split the Russians, the Soviets, and the Chinese to try and do this triangular diplomacy. And he felt that he could do that because he knew Europe was secure. <laughs> he felt he could turn towards Asia. He could focus on other parts of the world. And right. I think that carries on even now <laughs> that when Europe is safe and allied with the United States, then the United States can deal with global challenges elsewhere. So right. what I'm trying to say essentially is that, yeah, NATO is about Europe. It's about the security of Europe, but the security of Europe has shaped our world oh, yeah. by especially giving the United States um, options to act elsewhere. That's all I mean by that. But I appreciate the chance to clarify. Right. It's really important. Because <laughs> I saw that and I was like, I wonder if other people, it just popped into my head and I was like, I better bring us because a lot of people on my show we well, you know they hear that and it kind of like oh what, what what does that mean <laughs> sure i understand absolutely uh all right well i really appreciate you you know bringing some insight to especially nato because i think it's important that we 
know why NATO's there and uh, how important it still is. And as we can see that just because it's 70 years later doesn't mean we're not going to have some kind of conflict, war that could lead to something way bigger than we ever imagined. So I think, uh, you know, just like if you get jumped in the street, if you have 20 buddies with you, you know, you're going to be a little bit more uh, cautious of getting jumped. So <laughs> uh, that's right. You might not get jumped at all, which is right. the best situation, right? Yeah, exactly right. That's right. All right. Well, how do people find your book? And do you have any like speaking engagements or a YouTube channel or anything that people can uh, kind of hear, yeah. hear more about you? Well, thanks for mentioning. I'm off to the University of Florida to talk about it next week. And oh, so nice. I've been speaking at different universities. Um, and different groups in the US and Canada and, and England about this. Um, I still tweet about NATO all the time at Tim Sale and I share some of the documents that I use so people can see um, where I got my information. I think it's important for people to know um, that this isn't just my ideas. This is actually <laughs> right. from uh, from research I've done. So I, I do most of my uh, engagement on on Twitter and talk about my events coming up and my and speaking engagements there. Perfect. Well, we appreciate you and please come back anytime. Hopefully we won't need you for anything, you know, three or four months from now and call you back and go, hey, we need some more uh, <laughs> insight. But uh, hopefully it'll all cool down a little bit. But uh, uh, Professor Tim, thank you so much for being part of Truth Be Told. Thanks so much, Tony. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we Appreciate you always tuning in and being part of our show. Uh, as you got Robert Hensley on Monday for Minutemen Report, Bonnie Burkett on Wednesday, uh, or Monday for Robert, Wednesday for Bonnie uh, for Truth Be Told Transformation. Of course, me, uh, you have right here uh, on Fridays at 3 o'clock. And uh, next week, don't forget to tune in. We have uh, a great discussion about Atlantis. Yes, the great Atlantis, the myth the legend. So until next time, I'm Tony Sweet. And please subscribe, share, and uh, leave us some good comments. Take care, guys. This has been another episode of Truth Be Told. Thank you so much for watching. Recorded live at UBN Go Studios in Burbank, California. Join us on social media. Facebook, Truth Be Told Radio. Instagram, Truth Be Told Paranormal. Go to Truth Be Told Worldwide for more information on upcoming shows.